Father, we thank you for the beautiful day you've given us. Thank you for the privilege to meet together, to fellowship, and to open your word. And we pray for the master teacher, the Holy Spirit, to be mightily at work in every heart, that we would receive what you have for us in this first chapter of Titus. And for this we pray and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, good morning. We're in Titus chapter 1. Starting with about verse 6, we were going to start with the uh, character qualities that are set forth. Uh, Titus was to appoint and or to ordain elders in every city. And what kind of men would he be looking for? And that's what we find here. So let's start with a question. Uh, and there may be more than one way to answer this. I'm sure there probably is. But uh, we'll ask the question and see what, what you come up with. What would you say is the greatest need in the lives of most church members that you've ever met? What would you say is the greatest need that, uh, in the lives of most church members that you have ever met? we would miss a great lesson if we only look at these verses <clears throat> as qualifications for elders. Uh, elsewhere in the New Testament, all of these are things that are listed as the character qualities that are called for uh, in every Christian's life. So, um, what is the greatest way we can witness to a lost world around us by demonstrating Christ's likeness. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So it's godly Christian character would be uh, a way to say it as well. So the, uh, the words of our lips uh, in giving the gospel, passing out the track, uh, we need to be revealing and modeling what the track, what the preached sermon, what the Bible study, uh, the testimony that we've given. We need to be modeling that. So another related question, when God goes looking for men to set before a congregation for special purposes, elders, deacons, whatever, what does God look for? Does he look for uh, the gift of gab? Uh, seminary degree? No, nothing necessarily wrong with that. But uh, what is set forth here to equip us for effective Christian service is what is given here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and here in Titus uh, chapter 1. So we need uh, servant leaders who are called upon to display Christian character. And then we need um, the, the whole of the Christian life is to manifest to be a witness for Jesus Christ, right? So why would it be okay, or why would we say, well, now if you're going to be a pastor, or an elder or a deacon, yes, those, those people should be working on these, but I'm, I'm not even a Sunday school teacher. I don't sing the choir. Uh, ten, but I don't need to worry about all that stuff too much. Now, that's the way people think. I remember a fellow that uh, came to the Lord many years ago here, and he started really just going gangbusters and he was involved in home Bible studies, and he was witnessing to people where he worked. And some of the people came and said, what are you, a preacher or something? Now, on the one level, that was a compliment. But on the other level, that was a very bad reflection on the Christianity that this, these people had witnessed before. You, you're living on a level that we're expecting a preacher. What are you, a preacher or something? And they should say, well, what are you, a Christian or something? 
So, uh, and it's not, uh, you've heard, maybe, maybe heard the statement, uh, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. That ain't right. <laughs> yes, preach the gospel with your life and use words. It's not either or here. So, in these uh, uh, passages, we are, we're looking at character qualities, uh, ways in which we can model the life and ministry of Jesus Christ to a, to a watching world. And uh, in the passage in Timothy 3, you have a list for both deacons or elders and also for deacons. And here in Titus, the focus is on, on elders. So, but as we go along this morning, I want us, and we probably will go into the next week, Lord, uh, Lord willing as well. I want us to focus on what is God saying to me? And how does this relate to me? This character quality that is set forth here, how does it relate to me where I live in my family and the place uh, where I work. So, if we sit at the feet of Jesus, uh, these are the things that's gonna be coming out of our lives. So what's the first thing that is stated here in Titus chapter one, verse six? Well, you say, well, that depends on what translation you have. So, if any be blameless, is how the King James puts it. What does that mean? Does that mean, okay, you have, you've got to have no sin? Well, the scripture says if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. Uh, if we're still living under the lifestyle dominion of sin, that's a problem too. If he, uh, Romans chapter 6, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. And so this is not just a balance or a compromise of the two, but it shows a pattern of life, and some of the other translations may help. Um, if anyone is unaccusable, you may have been accused, and rightly so, but you went and made it right. You came to that person and said, you know what, when I did or said so and so, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? So now there's no unfinished business. There's nothing you, that you've not made right. No one can legitimately say that uh, you wronged them and did, didn't make it right. So this is, this is what it means to be blameless. A great hindrance to that is we feel like the other person needs to move first. I mean, after all, I might have lost my temper and I might have said and did so and so, but they did it first. Well, what they did doesn't matter. I mean, it matters between them and God. It matters for the testimony of Christ, but it has nothing to do with what you or I are supposed to do. Regardless of what the other person has done, I'm called to be blameless before the Lord Another translation is above reproach, unquestionable integrity, or reputation beyond reproach. So, uh, I've sinned, but I've confessed it, I've forsaken it, I've exercised myself to have a conscience clear before God and before all men. Remember, that, that was a position of the Apostle Paul. So that lets us know that the great Apostle Paul uh, had to fight spiritual battles. I exercise myself. Uh, here, here is a, an athlete's word. I mean, this is no uh, light thing. I exercise myself to have a conscience clear before God and before all men. Now again, if I'm going to have a godly Christian witness to my wife, to my children, uh, to the people I work with, then I've got to think in terms of being blameless. 
Now, who, who are the people in your life, and I'll have to ask myself, who are the people in my life where it's the most difficult to maintain blamelessness? Your own family. Huh? Your own family. Your own family. Uh, a lot of reasons for that. They know you best. They know you best. You know, when Cindy and I were dating, I don't remember us having a fight. <laughs> Is that amazing? We were, we were on conquest at that time. We were on best behavior. Yeah, right. And uh, none of this, I do not remember any of this being deliberate. We were ignorant of the ways of God. That's not an excuse. It's just a reality. And uh, most couples, when they're dating, they are on their best behavior because they don't want to lose their sweetheart. And so then they get married, and now I can be who I really am. So uh, we royally, not immediately, but we royally began to destroy one another. We found out we were radically different from each other. And at that point in our lives, we didn't have the tools to handle it. Well, excuse me, we had the tools in Christ, but we were not using them. And uh, God in his mercy kept us. And one of the things that kept us above all else was this underlying reality that we'd made a covenant for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, to death, do part. We did not have an exit. If you give yourself an exit, when times get tough, you'll just slack off because I don't have to do this anyway. But if you're living with a passion to please the Lord and you're wanting to be blameless before him, whether it's your wife, whether it's your children, whether it's someone you're in business with or a neighbor, then this affects everything. Yep. So this is, the, and this is why this is first. Because uh, this encompasses everything else. If I'm, if I'm slack on these other character qualities, I'm losing blamelessness. I, I'm, going to have, I'm going to cause reproach. So this is a, a, an excellent way to begin. Turn, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. And let's see this in the context of some scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11 And I'll read it from the King James and add a few other amplifications along the way. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, aliens and exiles. We're not home. We're in a foreign land, and, uh, but we're on mission. We're representing the King of Kings. Abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul, having your conversation or your conduct honest among the Gentiles. You have any Gentiles in your world? That is, heathen, people who do not know the Lord, no matter their nationality. And, and we're to maintain good contact, uh, conduct, a good manner of life in their presence because they're people to whom we are to be witnessing. And there are a lot of these people who absolutely make us furious. Excuse me. We allow them to make us furious. And uh, they do things and require things that we don't like. And it's the easiest thing in the world to criticize rather than to lose focus as to what we are here for. So... Again, in verse 12, having your conduct honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they may speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God. It may be in the day of judgment before they'll ever admit it. But sooner or later, they will have to admit that they were witness to they saw Christ because they were in your presence. Um, another translation says, 
they may learn as they watch from your uprightness of your conduct and from learning from that to praise God in the day of visitation. So submit yourselves to every ordinance and all of that. And there's a whole wonderful section here. Uh, let's go on down to uh, verse 19 or verse 18. Servants be subject to your masters, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. That's not a word we use. The unreasonable, the uh, cruel. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. I had a dear friend call me recently, and I've been to his house, but I've not been into his inner sanctum. <laughs> uh, he lives on four acres, and a part of his, his house is built kind of on a hill, and a lot of it is underground. And it might take a pretty good sized truck to empty out what's underground. All the ammo and the guns and all of this. And so he was asking me what guns I had and uh, okay, I have a 20 gauge shotgun. What, what kind of, tell me about the shells. Well, those are no good, they, they, they wouldn't help. You need to get this kind of shell. Plus, within a few months, it could be longer than that, people are going to be coming to your door. And you have to make a decision about whether or not you're going to defend your life. And, and I understand this gets very tricky, and, and there's a role in place for defending your family and all that. Uh, you, you can get into places real quick where it's, you're called upon to do something that you otherwise would not want to do. But in all of his conversation for about two hours, he finally came around and brought up the occasion where Jesus told his disciples, if you don't have a sword, get one. And then uh, he put the guy's ear back on where Peter had slashed it off. And I, I waited, I'm just listening. And, and he was talking about, this is what Jesus said. And I said, friend, this is exactly right, but have you ever thought about this? In all of the book of Acts and in all of the epistles, nobody in the church ever took that passage as a, as a call to arm themselves and when the opposition came to take life, they were willing to have their life taken, but they did not take life in order to preserve their life. Now again, I'm not saying there's never a time to do that. I'm just saying, I'm just reporting what I find in the New Testament and what we find historically. Uh, there, would, there would be a lot fewer martyrs uh, if, our, if, our, if we're going to model and say, okay, let's get the best weapons and, and let's shoot them before they shoot us. You remember there are some, some guys who went down to South America. They flew in and they would take the gospel. And they, unlike some other missionaries, had no guns. And the natives killed them all. But that's not the end of the story. When it was all said and done, uh, the gospel came to those people. And a great number of them were converted. We live in a fallen world and we have to make a decision to, in, in difficult places, the thing that must be paramount is the gospel. And there is a place for laying down your life for the gospel. When Jesus gives the closing words that he has for the church in his letters in Revelation, one of the things he says is, be thou faithful unto death. He didn't say, by the way, remember to pick up your sword. Now, again, I don't want to get into the debate. There's, again, I concede there's a place for uh, defending your family and all like that. And we can go to the Old Testament and, 
And Abraham took up uh, a bunch of guys and went and, and uh, set Lot free and so forth, etc. But the emphasis in Scripture is on manifesting the Spirit of Christ who could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. All right? So, back in uh, Titus uh, chapter 1, first character quality there is being blameless. So it continues... If any be blameless and the husband of one wife, having faithful children, uh, not accused of riot or unruly. And so then he comes back and says the bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. Now this, this gets into uh, territory where uh, Christians have a lot of different points of view. Some will say, well, it means uh, a wife, one wife at a time, <laughs> uh, or you must have a wife, uh, you can't be single, uh, and so forth. So I like to take it in the context of, of Scripture, and you be a Berean, and you search the Scriptures and be convinced in your own heart so when you look at the concept of, uh, and there are some people who say, well, this has nothing to do with marriage, uh, nothing to do with divorce. Well, I think it has something to do with marriage because it's talking about being the husband of one wife. And uh, the reason I would reject just being a statement against polygamy, because even though there was polygamy in the Old Testament, God never ordained it. God never set it forth. Uh, when Jesus was asked about marriage, he would go back to Genesis. Well, what about Moses? Moses gave this and this and this as a reason for divorce. And Jesus said, he did that because of the hardness of your heart. But in the beginning, it was not so. One man, one woman for life. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 uh, can you imagine the disarray of marriage and family at Corinth when you understand the, the, the wickedness that was going on in Corinth? And so here are these new converts. They were coming into the Christian faith from all kinds of scars and backgrounds. And, and there are a couple of things in 1 Corinthians 7 that is, are debatable as to how they are to be interpreted. But what is not debatable is that he lays the foundation. He says, well, he goes back to Genesis as well. In the beginning, here's how it was. God has never changed his mind on his pattern for marriage. One man, one woman for life. Is there the possibility for a widow or a widower to be remarried to marry someone who isn't a Christian and and so forth. Yes, but so here he's he's giving a uh, one of the one of the qualifications for pastors, elders, and also for deacons is that they have their marriage in order. Now, why would that be important? Well, you go to Ephesians chapter four or chapter five, Ephesians chapter five, and you remember that the Holy Spirit has the Apostle Paul say, now, husbands, love your wives. First of all, and maybe you like this, maybe you don't like this better, the wives came first, and there's more, more actual words to her section than ours. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Oh, but in front of that, he's already said, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So submission is not exclusive for the wife. We are, first of all, to submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. So then for the husband, it says, um, you're to love your wife even as, in the same manner as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And Philippians 2 talks about how that Jesus left heaven, came all the way down, and submitted himself 
to the cross. So this wonderful word of love um, has submission in it. This is, this is not, this is not a, a penalty. It's not a, a, a chain around the neck to, uh, like you, you got a, let's say you, you have a, a dog or a puppy and you, you put him on a chain and you walk off and he can only go so far and so that's how you control him. No. Uh, this is a, a love word. This is a, a word of great power and effectiveness. Where would we be had not Jesus submitted himself to the cross? Oh, and what were we like? Why we were yet enemies? And I'm being honest with you. People will disagree with me. That's okay. But I find no provision in the scripture for the deacon or the elder to be one other than one who, by the grace of God, can model the relationship between Christ and the church that, and model that which was God's intention. Here is a person who's going to be leading uh, as a servant leader. They need to be able to model God's intention. Now, the person who has scars in their past, part of the scars being a, a form of marriage, maybe two or three or whatever, now they're walking with the Lord, you can have a wonderful ministry and testimony of God's grace of grace greater than sin. You're not a model of God's in, original intention. And what I, what I plead and I seldom ever find as I, I say to people, okay, so you have previous marriages in your life. First of all, make sure you clear your conscience and you repent and you, so far as you can, make any kind of restitution if that's a, if that's a need. Make sure you forgive and, and all of that. And then uh, no longer blame is so common. I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who walked into my office and, and they're having troubles in their marriage and they have previous marriages. And I've never yet heard someone say, now I want to just say, yes, I've had a previous marriage and it was my fault or it was mostly my fault, or it was our fault. It's always, it was their fault. And, uh, well, that doesn't bring any glory to God, to be blame shifting. It's a wonderful day, if you have a previous marriage in your, in your life, to say, you know, back there, we blew it. We messed up. We didn't follow God's way. We were not Christians, or we were Christians. It doesn't matter. The point of it is, we partook of God's institution, and we blew it. And I can't speak for my former spouse, but I can say by the grace of God that I have humbled myself and repented, and I've gone to my f former spouse and said, you know, I did it and said so and so. It was wrong. Will you please forgive me? And in the present marriage, to have a no exit policy. Uh, in this present marriage, uh, I have no exits other than death. That not mean killing him, it means a natural death. <laughs> so, so, so what this does, so far as the ministry of the church, you have by the grace of God people who uh, in their mind and heart and in their practice are modeling the love of Christ and are modeling what God has done. Uh, what, did, what did God tell Hosea? I want you, here's your wife, she's left. Her second child, their, your second child means I'm not sure you're my child. The third child's name means you're no son of mine. And, but then she got into uh, just total harlotry, slavery. She's on the slave market. Hosea, I found your wife. She's over across town in the next city or whatever, and she's being sold today. Probably again. And your assignment, Hosea, is to go and buy her back and love her. 
And you say, that's impossible. Well, I hope it's not impossible because if it's impossible, then you can't have any salvation because that's what God did for you. And now God, by his Holy Spirit, lives within you to do th through you what he did for you. Wow. Wow. How powerful is the grace of God. And so, but again, I, I've uh, pled with people who got had previous marriages. You don't have to be a second class Christian. Uh, you can be a first rate servant of the Lord. You, there are many things that you can do and be effective in God's kingdom. And not the least of which is to humble yourself and say, here's my testimony. Here's what God has did. Here's how God humbled me. Now, I'm in a wonderful second marriage now. And, and you're thinking, and this happens very often, you're thinking that what I need is a second marriage because Joe and Sam, or Joe and Susie, uh, there are some girls named Sam. <laughs> uh, or a girl named Sue or something like that. But anyway, uh, Susie and George... Uh, they're thinking, well, that's what we need to do. We need to get a divorce. We married the wrong one. Can't tell you how many times I've heard that. No, please don't do that. We failed in our first marriage. Our second marriage is working only because we're doing that which we never did in the first one. But when it comes to this list of qualifications, the Holy Spirit points out this as to marriage doesn't make any provision for anything else and it is so sacred what what is being portrayed here the relationship between Christ and the church this is sacred this is more sacred I mean murder is a heart, is an issue a strong issue a problem in life but there's nothing more horrendous than the ultimate sin against love you're called to love your wife as Christ loved the church and if we don't do that, then the sin against love is, is astounding. And so I think that's why we have the limitation here. Fifty years ago, it was very rare for anybody to hold a position in Bible-believing circles other than the one I hold. Now the position I hold to is very rare. And there's been an adopt, adapting to the culture. And this on, as on so, so many other issues. But uh, what I have found is I sit among pastors who have divorce in their background. Uh, it doesn't matter if it happened when they were saved or when they were lost or whatever. None of those pastors take a strong stand about marriage because they feel like they can't. Because after all, they've been divorced. And I've never seen a pastor but that that affected how they treated marriage and how they treated uh, the qualifications for, for elders and deacons. And so you, you start <coughs> opening the gate and, and each generation opens it further and further and further and further. So, again, I know that everybody's not going to be on the same page. I love you. I hope you love me. But I cannot in good conscience before God uh, be a part of ordaining someone who, by the grace of God, is unable to model this sacred relationship, but which, which is, is, someone has said, if, you're, if your Christian life doesn't work at home, then don't export it. Uh, it's just a, it's a huge area and it, it affects much more than whether or not uh, you have had a divorce. It affects your mind. Your, your, uh, we live in a time where uh, many people in the pulpit all the way to the back pew are uh, slaves to pornography. That is not functioning as a one man woman. That is serious, serious sin. And if it's known, it needs to be repented of. And there, there could need to be a, a 
uh, leave of absence. If there's no repentance, there would need to be a public rebuke and a, re a losing of that privilege of serving. This is serious business. But so when, when you try to hold a godly stand, what I'm gonna call a godly stand on this, people say, well, but you're saying you're not forgiven. Aren't you now forgiven? Well, Paul, uh, uh, King David was forgiven, but he limped and there were things he was not allowed to do. Now you say, yeah, but he was a believer all the time. Uh, if you can make that distinction, uh, I'm not God, I'm not your conscience, but I can't make that distinction. Here is the, whether you're saved or lost, you are taking part of a sacred institution that goes all the way back to Genesis. <coughs> and, and, as, and as a pastor or as a deacon, you should be able, by the grace of God, to model that divine institution, one man, one woman for life. If you can't, there's still wonderful things you can do. You're, you're not a second class Christian, there's just something you can't do. There are many other things that you can do. You can preach, you can teach, you can do many other things. You can't be a deacon or an elder, at least at this point in this local congregation. <laughs> in most places you can. In fact, we had a number of years ago, we had a family that moved in and they were visiting, they really liked the church. He'd been an elder in another church. And when he found out our position, he said, well, I'm, I'm not coming back. He wanted to be in a church where he could serve as an elder. Well, I'm, that's between him and the Lord. Uh, we couldn't change our position in order to get a good member. So the, the danger of taking the other position is that everywhere I have seen, people ultimately will water down this thing, and it doesn't stop here. It just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. It's almost like the person, the only person who uh, is assured, it's just quite a different thing, but one of the things that kept me from ever drinking alcohol was I was afraid that if I ever took the first drink, I'd cross a bridge and I might not ever stop. Of course, I had in my background, I never saw my father drunk, but he was quite a drinker before I was born, and then both of my brothers went down the road big time. And I was deathly afraid, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah. I'm grateful of <laughs> sitting in a, a Sheraton Inn in Delhi, New Delhi, India, and you walk in, and here's this big cabinet, and you open it up, and there's every drink known to man in there, I guess. <laughs> and I'm fiddling with, I wonder what this tastes like. I'm 7,000 miles away from anybody who knows me. I had some curiosity, but I had uh, immediately I had fear. If I cross that line just out of curiosity. Now that's, that was a different ball game than when I was in Spain and at communion, the communion drink burnt all the way down to my toes. <laughs> It was, it was not Welch's. <laughs> but see, I was, I was not trying to uh, dilly-dally with something that I'm going to get some pleasure from. So there was no temptation there whatsoever. Where, regardless of where you come down on this issue, you, you and I have to understand that in the fine tuning of it, we may be at a little bit different place, but that it is impossible in the day in which we live to take this too lightly. I mean, it, 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 we just can't. Uh, marriage and family is under the bus. And everywhere you turn, there are enemies to the home. And everywhere you turn, there's some voice wanting to give you justification for doing something that you have no justification for. So, uh, take full responsibility, uh, ask for, give, receive forgiveness, rest in that forgiveness, 
uh, and go forward uh, serving the Lord. Again, it's important because it's God's original intent. Uh, there's something more to marriage than marriage, Ephesians 5. He talks about the, the act of marriage, and he says, but what I'm talking to you about is the relationship between Christ and the church. So these are strong exhortations that the pastor, the deacon, or the elder should be able to portray the sacred mystery of Christ and the church. What a high calling. So, and just apart from the whole issue of deacons and elders, I want to just say one other thing. Uh, there, there is another uh, issue in all this. People say, yes, okay, you have that position, but what you need to understand is that God himself is a divorcee. And they pull one verse out of Jeremiah where he says, I've given you a bill of divorcement. So did God divorce Israel? Well, you take all of the scripture in Jeremiah and you take all of the scripture in all of the Bible. God did not divorce Israel. And, and again, as we, at the root of all this is the everlasting love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I remember... Uh, there was a Dr. Bates, I don't remember his first name, he was a pastor somewhere over in North Carolina. And uh, I was at a meeting and he was sharing that one of the lead people in his church came and sat down in his office and said, blah, 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 and so and so about his wife. He really painted her in a bad picture and he said, I'm, um, I'm divorcing her. And really, he was wanting the pastor's stamp of approval. And the pastor just opened his Bible and said, uh, Sam, uh, here's what the Bible says. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. And so Sam said, well, but, and he painted a worse picture. And uh, he went through two or three things like this. And, and finally, the, when he got through the, this last time, uh, the pastor opened the, the Bible to some of the words of Jesus who says, love your enemies and pray for them and bless them. And it sounds like to me from what you're describing, if your wife is, is as bad as you say she is, she's an enemy. Go home and love her. The Bible just didn't give any exits just because things were tough. And it's a wonderful day when you don't give yourself exits from the clear will of God. This is not about what they've done or what they've done to you or whatever. It's, Lord, what are you saying in your word to me? How can I honor you? How can your name be glorified through my life as a result of my response? And let's be honest. That doesn't set well with us. Because we are so sure that what the other person has done to me should have some impact on giving me some leeway to respond the way I want to respond. Their flesh. The enemy would use it to ignite my flesh. And I want to pay back. You hit me, I want to hit you back kids on the playground, except I want to hit you a little bit harder. There's a place outside of Dayton, Tennessee. It's a little uh, unincorporated village. It's called Evansville. <laughs> I've often wondered who named it and why. <laughs> Father, we bless you and praise you for the privilege to study your word and help us in the personal and practical application of our own lives and on some of these things where we come out down in different places, we, we all have to land at the place of, Lord, 
uh, I want to glorify you above all else. And if you want me to change, I'll change. But most of all, Lord, I want others to see Christ. And I want to uh, be uh, walking in a path of, of laying down my life for others because those are the paths that Jesus walked in. We're to walk in the steps of Jesus. Help us have grace for it. Each of these men here have unique circumstances where it is very difficult for them, even as I have things in my own life. And we ask especially for grace in those areas to glorify you. Father, this is a battle. It's an ongoing battle. We have to put off the old man, put on the new. We have to, we have not yet striven unto blood, striving against sin. Help us to look upon Jesus and be increasingly transformed. And we bless you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.